Y'all remember offering songs? Like, like, ready for this one? Bless, bless, bless. Say I, bless. Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all. Right, right. Every church did the Fred Hammond song. We blessed. And we go up, we do a little runway giving, you know. Every lady dresses to the nine. Because giving time is really letting everybody know what your outfit look like time. And so you go up there and just do your bless, dance, you know, bless, bless. <laughs> um, but we loved offering time for that because we were making a declaration. We're blessed. So we dance this thing. You know, we dance the blessing dance. I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. <laughs> that was my blessing. Uh, that was my blessing dance, you know. Just, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was my, that was my, my blessed, my blessed dance, my blessed dance. Um, we, it's funny because I think what it did was, is I think it wired us away to think about being blessed the wrong way. Um, it's interesting because when we were given, it was almost like God was like more of a lottery ticket. You know, I'm gonna put my little blessing in here. You know what I'm saying? So I can get my blessing because if I get my blessing, then I'm blessed. I'm blessed because I get my blessing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, what does it mean to be blessed? Right? What does it mean to be blessed? Often what I find is, is that we make being blessed about what we have. Rather than being blessed about being something. We make being blessed about getting stuff. Rather than being in a state of mind. We make being blessed, you know, I got a new car, so I'm blessed. blessed. I just got married, so I'm blessed, blessed. right? You know, I got myself a new outfit. I'm blessed. blessed. I get a promotion at work. I'm blessed. blessed. I never heard, or rarely do I ever hear somebody say, I got locked up and I'm blessed. I got evicted and I'm blessed. Anybody heard that one? And I'm blessed. And yet often this is what we do. We attach being blessed to what we have or to what we acquire or to what we establish or to what promotions we get. We make being blessed about that. And yet notice here that Paul in Acts chapter 20 is giving a little teaching on what it means to be blessed and yet When you think about it, you have to ask yourself the question, does this guy, Paul, have any authority to talk about what it means to be blessed? I mean, this is the guy that's coming to teach and saying, guys, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I guess the question that I would ask is, is Paul an authority on the subject of being blessed? Let me give you a little background here. Ready for this? If you go to Acts chapter 9, just go to Acts chapter 9 real quick. Um, And we're just going to go through a little quick tour. You guys got to move fast. I want you to move fast with me. I want to give you a little background on this guy here. This guy, Paul, who is saying to people that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the guy, Paul, who when he encounters Jesus in Acts chapter 9, that first section of the text, in Acts chapter 9, when he encounters Jesus at the road of Damascus, his miracle was that he lost his sight. Then he gets his sight back later on in verse 10. And after he gets his sight back, he gets baptized. And then once he gets baptized, he takes no hesitation. And if we go further down, takes no hesitation in verse 21 to now proselytize the gospel, to begin to proclaim the gospel. That's a little side note there. You don't need a degree to begin to, pr- to, to, to promote the gospel. That's, that's another conversation for another day. Paul gives his life to Jesus, loses his sight. Get, he, he gets baptized, gets his sight back, but then immediately he proclaims the gospel. And in proclaiming the gospel, the response to the gospel that he preached, look at in verse 23. In verse 23, the re- response to the gospel is death threats. So now this guy who just gave his life to Jesus now is being threatened to death. So Paul's like, all right, cool. I got to get out of there. So then Paul runs out of that area. He goes to Jerusalem. Why? Because he wants to meet some other Christians. So he goes to Jerusalem and says, let me go chill with the disciples. He goes to the disciples and the disciples don't even want to be his friends. His disciples say, nah, bro, we've heard of you and we heard about who you are and what you did. We ain't about that life. 
Paul then takes a pause. If you go to chapter 13, then we see a little pause there. Some stuff happens. Paul ain't got no friends. Paul got death threats. Paul doesn't have anybody that he's connected to. And then in chapter 13, we find him again preaching the gospel in Antioch, and he gets jumped. He gets jumped and beaten by rioters. Then he goes to Iconium in chapter 14, verse 1. In Iconium, he almost gets stoned to death. And then after he almost gets stoned to death, he then goes to Europe because he's like, man, these people ain't about it. He goes to Europe and then he gets locked up. So this Paul, who who he comes to Jesus, this Paul who comes to Jesus is threatened to death. This Paul who comes to Jesus is getting jumped. This Paul who comes to Jesus loses his sight. This Paul who comes to Jesus gets ridiculed by even his fellow Jews. In chapter 16, we see that it chronicles Paul continuing on with his suffering in in which he is now being ridiculed by the Jews. In chapter 16, he now has to sit and defend his faith to other people that were supposed to be of the faith. He's lost friends. He's lost connections. he's He's thought of as a crazy man. This Paul then goes to Acts chapter 20. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul faces three months of arguing his faith. Engaging in apologetics with the great thinkers who thought that he was crazy. And it's this Paul now, after he's gone to Thessalonica, after he's gone to Iconium, after he's gone to Ephesus, after he's gone to Philippi, this Paul gets to, he returns back to Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul said, look at verse 25. And in verse 25, Paul even tells them, he says, before he gives this speech, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. This Paul says, listen, brothers, this is going to be the last time you see me. This is going to be the last time you hear from me. Why? Because Paul knows when he leaves Ephesus, he's either going to get locked up or he's going to be killed or he's going to be sentenced to death. This does not seem like a guy who has any authority to speak on what it means to be blessed. Y'all catching what I'm saying? Like, if you want to find somebody and ask them, yo, what does it mean to be blessed? Paul does not seem like the guy to talk to about what it means to be blessed. And yet Paul... This man who's not married, this man who's been jumped, run out of cities, arrested, locked up, suffered, family left him behind, friends have left him behind. This Paul, who you would say has lost it all, is now the Paul that's telling you what you need to do to be blessed. That's tough. Right? And because Paul has experienced what it means to be blessed, Paul now feels in a sense that he's got an authority to speak on what it means to be blessed. Why? Because Paul understands this, that being blessed is not about what you have. But being blessed is a function of how you respond. To what you have. Oh, y'all ain't with me. Y'all ain't with me today. It's not about what you get. It's about how you respond to what you get. It's not about what you've acquired. But it's about how you respond to what you want proof. I'm going to give you proof. You ready for proof? Would most of you here consider receiving a BMW a blessing? See, there you go. That, I work on your heart. After church, lay hands on you and pray for you. He said, what type of BMW? It's a problem with this generation today. What type of BMW? It, it, it's a functioning BMW, okay? By the way, everybody say happy birthday to Big Hero 6. <laughs> Big Hero 6. I got you, didn't I? You weren't ready for that. No, no. 
You are ready. You are ready. Um, what does it mean? What does Paul mean by being blessed? He's saying it's a response to what you get. So take a BMW for a second. You would say that it's, it's a blessing. All right, let me downgrade a little bit. I'm, I'm afraid to downgrade because y'all bougie out here. <laughs> a brand new Toyota Corolla. <laughs> what? <laughs> would you consider a brand new Toyota Corolla a blessing? Yes. <laughs> Somebody feels like, man, is pastor about to bless me? <laughs> Twenty nineteen. Brand new, would you consider that a blessing? Yes. What if I told you that it isn't necessarily a blessing? Because it's how you respond to how you receive it that makes it a blessing. I'll give you proof. I'll give you proof. If you already had a Bentley and you had to change your Corolla for the Bentley, would you consider it a blessing? But if you had bus passes and you got it, would you consider it a blessing? Oh, y'all missing what I'm saying. Y'all missing it. Y'all missing it. It's not the thing that's the blessing. It's the heart that receives the thing that makes it a blessing. You might not have a car. And because you didn't have a car when you got the car, it was a blessing. It was not too long ago. I'm going to throw this out there. That I didn't have a car. And I will take anything. Anybody had something? I received a blessing from a church who said, hey, would you take this 2008 Honda Accord? I said, praise the Lord. Yes, I will. <laughs> I will definitely take it, but if you had asked the Isaac eight years ago if receiving an 08 Honda Accord was a blessing, he would have told you, bro, what am I going to do with that when I got a brand new Porsche Cayenne? What would I do with your 08 Honda Accord? <laughs> but I will never forget the feeling I had. I, mean, I took pictures in front of it. I was like, I got home, I got home, I said, Vi, get out the car, come and see what I got. Vi came out the house, and like, oh my God, baby, you got a new Honda Accord. I was like, yeah, girl. And you know, it was a, it was a manual, so I barely knew how to drive it, because I had to, you know, I was still figuring out how to run the manual. But I said, y'all boys, let's get in the car. I took Ellison to Izzy, threw him in the back. We were like, all right, we're going to get some ice cream. We're going to celebrate. Because we, we went to Cold Stone. I almost killed him because I didn't know how to drive a stick shit. So I'm like, we're going to get there, baby. We're going to get We're going to get there. But if you had asked the Isaac 10 years ago, he'd be like, what am I going to do with a stick shift Honda Accord? Oh, hey. So the question is, was the Honda a blessing? Or was it that it was the person who received it that made it the blessing? Yeah. <sighs> what am I saying to you? I'm saying being blessed is not what you have. Being blessed is about who you are when you receive what you have. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's about you. You're the one that makes your life a blessing or not. It is not about the stuff you got. It's not about the car. It's not about the car. There's some, married, there's some single folks that are wishing to be married who say, if I get married, then I'll feel like I'm blessed. And there's some married folks that are wish they were single and say, if I was single, then I would be blessed. Can I preach that real quick? Yeah. There's some folks who got some jobs. You would say, you would think, man, they got a good job. They're blessed. And that same person is the one that's trying to quit the job. We have lived in a culture and a society where we believe that it is what we receive that makes us blessed. And so we live in a comparison culture where we look at this person, we say they're more blessed. We look at that person, we say they're more blessed. As a matter of fact, because in the church, we have taught that being blessed is about the possessions we acquire, the titles we, we attain. We're shameful when we lose those things wow. to the point where if we lose our job, we won't come to church because we'll feel like we have lost something in God. Can I dig a little bit? How does this Paul find, y'all cool with me? Y'all okay with me real quick? How does this Paul now translate what it means to be blessed? Because we can have a lot of things and still ultimately not be blessed. The word blessed, if you've seen it in the Beatitudes, being blessed, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount preaches what it means to be blessed. As a matter of fact, the word blessed in the text is the word happy. 
It means happy. Being blessed means what? If you want to write that down. When you say I'm blessed, what you're really saying is you're happy and a lot of you are lying. To be blessed means to ultimately be fulfilled. And some of you are saying, I got the car, so I'm blessed. Liar. Because you still cry in it. You go around telling people, I'm married, I'm blessed. But you hate being at home with him or her. You're not blessed because you got stuff. You're blessed because you're happy. And sometimes the stuff that you get can impede you from being happy. Sometimes good things can keep you from being happy. Proof? We'll buy cars we can't afford. Work double shift, triple shifts. We'll be miserable getting our blessing. We will, we will sacrifice the most important things in life to acquire titles, recognition, money, home cars and leave ultimately depressed, unfulfilled, angry, empty, unsatisfied. So my question is for you, are you blessed? Are you blessed? All right. So you might ask, well, what does it mean then? All right, Pastor, you, you, you got me. You got me. So what then does it mean to be blessed? Let's go to Philippians chapter 4 real quick. This guy who's in authority on the subject, go to Philippians chapter 4. This guy who's in authority on the subject, you know, Paul does his giving talk in Philippians chapter 4. And, and honestly, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant giving talk. You know what I'm saying? It's a brilliant giving talk. And, and Paul says a few things. Are y'all with me so far? Do I have y'all attention? Okay, cool, cool. Just stick with me because I, I, I want to dig into the word. I want to teach this a little bit for you. Paul, um, um, first of all, Paul speaks here of, um, he, he, he speaks when he's talking in Philippians chapter 4 from the posture of a man who is blessed. He speaks from the posture of a man who is fulfilled. A man who was content. This is the guy who went to jail, got locked up, got beat up, got run out. This guy who you would say has suffered. He's talking about he's blessed. And now this is what he says. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. I'll just get a side, side, side note on this. Paul is saying I rejoiced in the Lord. So Paul is saying is, is I'm encouraged in God. I feel a covenant with God, an enjoyment with God. I feel something with God. I'm connected with God, and I'm rejoicing in God. Why? Because of your renewed care for me. This is a side note. I know it's coming from a preacher, so take it while you got it. There's nothing more encouraging than when a church financially supports the ministry. Nothing is more encouraging. Now, Paul is saying, I don't do it. Watch this. Paul is not saying, I, I feel encouraged for myself. Paul is saying, I feel encouraged in the Lord. As a matter of fact, for, for those of you who are in the ministry, who support the ministry financially, you encourage your pastor in the Lord. You encourage his relationship with God because you're allowing him to move in a way in which he becomes optimistic. He can become visionary about the things that he will do moving forward. Not to say I received a check from the church. I, I know church ain't there yet. What I'm saying is when I see there's giving in the church, it encourages me to push the church forward. It encourage me, encourages me to be a visionary. It encourages our leadership to move forward because our church is along with us. Paul is saying this. He's saying, I rejoice in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. He's saying, you have given again. You're supporting again. And for that, I'm encouraged and I rejoice in God. But notice, he's saying the reason why is because you didn't have the opportunity before. For whatever reason, Paul is giving indication here that it wasn't that they weren't generous. They were actually very generous. But but for some reason, something kept them from being able to give. And so Paul is saying now that now that they have this renewed opportunity, they took the opportunity and they gave. And then Paul then goes into um, verse 11. Stay with me here. He says, I don't say this out of need. Understand that Paul was a guy who was already running his businesses. So Paul is not saying, I need your money. But Paul is saying, for I have learned. 
Somebody say learn. Paul said, for I have learned. Somebody say learned. I have, what's the word? Ooh. Paul says, I have learned to do what? Did y'all catch that? I came to teach this now. Paul says, I have done what? Learned. To be? Let me do that again. I think somebody missed it, so let me. Paul says, I have Learned. to be? Content. You know, in my Bible right here, you know, I highlighted it in nice and pink right there. And I put a circle around learned. And I put a circle around content. Content doesn't come naturally. Happiness does not come naturally. Happiness is something you need to learn. <sighs> Let me say that one more time. You can't get stuff to be blessed. You have to learn to be blessed. All right, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. You have to learn to be blessed. You can't automatically be blessed. You can get cars all day. You can get homes all day. You can get money all day. You can get recognition all day. And even after you get all of it, you don't feel blessed. Why? Because you cannot be blessed naturally. You got to go to the school of being blessed. You've got to go to instruction to be blessed. You've got to learn to be blessed. You have to go through training to be blessed. Blessing is not something that comes naturally. Blessing is something that requires training because blessing is not based or a function of what you have acquired or what you have attained or what has been given to you. Blessing is a function of how you go about interpreting. Ooh, somebody say learn. Learn. You can't be happy, nor can you be fulfilled if you do not learn to be blessed. I got to teach this because you want to know something? In a country, watch this now, in the United States of America, a country that is the richest country in the world, why are we so emotionally poor? In a country that is wealthy, why are we so depressed? In a country that has so many things, why are we so unfulfilled? We got the money. We got, somebody said, man, I'm broke. I said, you broke? Let me tell you something about being broke. I said, are you sleeping in the house tonight? Yes. You're doing better than 10%. You're doing better than 90% of the world. Do you got AC tonight? Yeah. You're doing better than 95% of the world. Are you going to have clean water to drink? Yeah. Can you find clean water? If you can go to a mall and get some clean water and drink it, my, my God, you're doing better than 90% of the world. Who gave you the right to feel like you ain't blessed? And yet there's some folks who are walking hours and hours and hours a day just to find a water spout, just to put a gallon of clean water in it and to walk hours and hours and hours a day back. And if you were to ask them, are you blessed? You know, some of them would say yes. It's sad that some of the people with the least of things are happier than some of the people with the most of things. Ooh. Am I digging in? I'm sorry, y'all. I love y'all. But there's something that's frustrating me as a pastor is seeing a people who have so much to be thankful for and so much to be grateful for and for them to feel like they ain't got it to feel like they need something. Ready for this? The moment that you make it about what you have, you will always feel like you ain't got enough. 
And the moment that you make it about what you have, you'll always feel like somebody has more. As a matter of fact, all relational sin is the sin of covetousness. That husband is hers, but I wish he was mine. That money is his, I wish it were mine. That car is his, I wish I had a car like that. Because we have learned now, or we've been programmed to believe in our culture that the more things we have, the more dollars we have in our bank account, the more stuff we can acquire, the more titles we can attain, the more degrees we can have, the happier we'll be. And yet some of the most miserable people are the most successful, the most wealthy, the most renowned, and the most famous. Every day you hear on the news, famous people are committing suicide. Successful people. The stuff you're trying to get, there's some folks who got it and they can't even live with it. Can I dig in? Because this Paul says, I have learned to be content. How? Look at the next verse, next part of the verse. In whatever what, what, what's that? What's that? In whatever what? In whatever what? In whatever state I'm in, or some translations will say whatever situation I'm in, or another translation will say in whatever circumstance I'm in, in whatever circumstance I'm in, I what? I have learned to do what? To oh my goodness. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. Church, we are not there. We are not there. You want to know why? Because there's a lot of us that feel like we'll be happy if we get this. We'll be happy if we get that. And so we're not satisfied or content in the circumstance that I'm in. But a person who knows what it means to be blessed, who knows what it means to be happy, who has learned contentment will say, I'm married, I'm blessed. I'm divorced, I'm blessed. I'm single, I'm blessed. I'm broke, I'm blessed. I got money, I'm blessed. I got a home, I'm blessed. I get evicted, I'm blessed. No matter what I have, I got kids, I'm blessed. I don't have kids, I'm blessed. No matter what what circumstance or situation I'm in, I have learned to be blessed. Learn to be, to be blessed in whatever circumstance or whatever situation I'm in. How insulting it is for us to come to God and say that he's not enough. To say, God, I'm not happy because I'm not married. God, I'm not happy because I got an eviction notice. What are you saying when you say that? You're saying, God, you're not enough. I'm not happy until I get this home. Is there anything wrong with any of these things? No. There's something wrong when we get it for happiness. There's something wrong when you get it to be fulfilled. Something wrong when you get it, when you feel like I'm missing something, so if I get this, whatever I'm missing will be filled. And yet it is those very things that will never fully satisfy our desires. And some of y'all might be asking this question, right? Do I got y'all here? Damn, this is tough. It's tough. Is this convicting? I'm sorry. Y'all mad at me? I love y'all. That's why I do this. I do this because I love you. This is all love. Because I want, I want my church to be happy. I want my church to be happy. And so Paul says, you want to learn to be blessed? Because <laughs> Paul's saying to be blessed is something you need to learn. You want to learn to be blessed? Ready for this? Anybody want to know how to be happy? Just me? Okay. <laughs> I, I want to I be happy. So I'm, like, I'm already happy, Pastor. Hmm, you ain't preaching to me. <laughs> okay. Sure. You want to learn to be happy? Ready for this? Give. Whew. That's tough. You're like, wait, so you tell me I got to give my offering right now? No, not offering. Give. Give money. Give time. Give influence. Give without expecting anything in return. Don't just give to this church. Give to your business. Give to your job. Give to your family. 
Give to a random guy on the street. Give to, if you want, you want to learn, you want to be happy, see, you got you to unplug for a moment. You got to rethink for a moment and realize all the stuff you thought that would make you happy really don't make you happy. They aren't making you happy. As a matter of fact, the more you give, the more God cultivates your heart. The more God shapes your heart the more he begins to rewire you and the more you begin to enjoy the goodness of life and what life is all about. I'll give a testimony. All right, don't get on me, okay, baby? Don't get on me, all right? So um, I'll give a little quick testimony and then we're going to close it. So uh, y'all know the little Cliff Note version of our story. Um, I had a pretty decent job, decent job. My wife had a pretty decent job. We're doing pretty good. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. Um, we were living downtown. We were kind of living the life. You know, we had the money. We had all the stuff. We're doing, really, we're doing, we're doing all right. We're doing all right. We, we, we weren't worried about nothing. I ain't worried about nothing. Okay? <laughs> we weren't worried about nothing. God's still working on it. Um, and I remember wrestling with God about being called to go into ministry. And so I said, you know what? How am I going to do this? How are we going to, I mean, we got a lifestyle. We got some things to keep up with. We got some stuff. We got to, I don't know how we're going to do this. I'm not sure uh, about what we're going to do. And so we thought it out. We planned it out. You know, I was going to quit my job. You know, I was going to quit my job. But, you know, she was making some good money. So I was like, cool, you're making some good money. You know what I'm saying? You can just hold it down for us, you know, and I'm just going to do this ministry thing. I thought that was a big sacrifice. I thought a big sacrifice was losing my paycheck and losing my income. So we quit our job. We said, okay, we're going to downgrade a little bit. We're going to move to Pino. You know what I'm saying? Just move it down. Because, you know, we were living downtown for a lot of there on the condo. We're like, all right, let's, you know, let's, 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 let's simplify. Because, you know, it's comfortable. We can simplify. We budgeted. We reset. Nothing wrong with planning. A man will plan his ways, but it's the Lord that orders his steps. That's another sermon for another day. And then afterwards, we said, all right, cool, cool, cool. So then, you know, we, we got a new place. We signed the lease agreement for the new place. Um, and then, you know, I had already quit my job. And then, um, <clears throat> Um, so we signed the lease, and then the day before the lease, we got a paper saying, come and get your deposit, because um, we found somebody else is paying more. So <clears throat> I said, oh, say what? Yeah, come and get your deposit and your contract. I said, oh, so where am I going to go? Because I got to leave tomorrow. I said, well, I don't know. So we had a rental waiting for us. Where's JC? JC's not here. JC remembers that. I called JC. I said, JC, um, I-, I need you to come help me put my stuff somewhere. Where are you going to put it? I said, I don't know where I'm going to put it. Uh, I'm figuring it out right now, but I need help. I had a bunch of guys come in over to my house, loaded up the U-Haul, didn't know where we were going. I just went to a storage facility, dropped everything into the storage facility. Did not know where we were going that night. I was like, girl, we got this. You know what I'm saying? We're going to get another spot. It's all good. Everything's straight. Everything's gravy. We got this. So cool. We got it. And then afterwards, <clears throat> um, got a call from mom. Mom was like, yo, if you, if you, need, if you need to stay somewhere temporary, you know, just come and stay over at my place. I was kind of like... <sighs> Back at my parents' house. I don't know if I like that. But then again, we got this. We can get this in a week. We're straight. Cool. Came over there. At the time, Ellison was three years old. So we opened up a little playpen in the corner. He was around two years old. Put a little playpen in the corner. Had him in the corner. He said, okay, babe, so tomorrow, you know what I'm saying, we're we going we gonna to start doing some job hunting, whatever. She calls me the next day and says, um, I just got laid off. I said, oh, you did what? What, you, what did you just say? I said, yeah, um, yeah. I said, okay, oh, snap, um, all right. Okay, so you got laid off, okay, all right. Um, what are we gonna do, what are we, okay, um, you gonna apply for another job? Yeah, I'm gonna find another job, it should, it should be pretty quick, you know, we, we, we got this, don't worry about it, I got it, I got it, I got it. So, okay, cool, we'll go ahead and work that out. Um, a week later, um, Isaac, I'm pregnant. I said, no, she said, Isaac, I'm late. And I said, late for what? <laughs> you ain't got a job? Neither one of us got a job. We ain't got nowhere to go. What you late for? Um, she, said, she said, I'm late. I said, I said late. Um, and then, um, so, yeah, so she took a test. And then um, <clears throat> it said um, there was a plus. So I'm going, what does that mean? She's like, I'm pregnant. I said, great. <laughs> that was initially how I felt. And, and then she said, okay, so what now? I said, I don't know, because you're pregnant, you can't get a job. Should I go back and apply for a job? I don't, I don't know, what should I do? I just said yes to God about leaving my job to start a ministry. And yet, over a period of a year, we had no job. I, I can't give all the details. 
I can't, if I give all the details, you're going to freak out. You know, the Audi, we, I had returned my Porsche because I was like, we're, we're, we're simplifying. So I returned the Porsche, got a smaller car, you know, did a little, you know, simplified life. She still had her Audi, and then her Audi caught on fire. Her Audi caught on fire for a one-day lapse in insurance. That's another conversation for another day. We needed healing in our marriage for that. And then afterwards, um, so, so now, a few months later, you know, my car gets stolen. So now, we don't have a car. Neither one of us has a car. Neither one of us has a place to stay. I got a two-year-old son, a pregnant wife. She can't get a job, and I'm confronting God. In all my frustration, over time, we eventually found a place to stay. We moved. We were in Pompano, and um, everybody knows that Pino spot. Yeah, we had a drug lord that lived right next to us. It was a crazy, <laughs> crazy deal. Another story for another day. Um, he was a great guy, though. Um, you know? He was, he was, he was, he was, we were down. We were good. We were good. We were good until I saw ATF and DEA all up in front of the door. And I was like, yo, oh, you got it like that? Dang. Okay. He was on the newspaper and everything. It was crazy. Um, I should have prayed for him. I should have prayed for him. I said, Lord, you didn't reveal this to me? I was running a drug ring right, right next to my kids. Um, but anyway, long story short, we went four years. Neither one of us working. Neither one of us having a job. We depleted our entire savings. Depleted our entire, we depleted everything. And we got caught to zero, and I saw a red letter in the mail. I looked at that red letter, I said, what's this? So that's eviction notice. And I said, huh, and I don't have an answer to this. And then around that time, in all my frustration, imagine, you would say, would you have to argue that that guy ain't blessed? He ain't blessed right now. Because that guy's angry, that guy's pissed off. I wasn't a good guy to be around because I'm like, yo, what am I going to do with life? Life is really messed up right now. And I remember I had $3 in my pocket and I go and walk out. At the time, because the way I was taking my son to work and to school was I was taking the bus. Bus 50 was my life. So I had a bus pass, the whole thing. I was getting around in a bus. That's, that's the only way I'd move around or I'd walk. And I, and I remember after um, dropping my son off to school, because he was right off of Bus 50 down near um, um, downtown Fort Lauderdale. I remember walking out, and then a guy comes up to me and says, hey, um, sir, I, I, need, I, I, need, I need $3. Do you have $3 for me? The first thing I wanted to say, I don't want to say what I was thinking, because I'm more saved now. But I was thinking something else. So I was thinking Negro. Listen. Let's <laughs> just stick with it. I said, I said Negro, what? I said, I said, I ain't got no money, bro. I ain't got no money for you. But what was odd to me was the guy asked me for three. Anybody ever asked for three dollars? That's crazy. For somebody to ask you for three dollars. Very specific. So I said, why would he ask for three dollars? So I said, I gave him three dollars. I was not happy. The whole time going, so now, so now I had a plan for that three dollars. It was going to be a small coffee and a bagel. Everybody knows it comes out to an even $3 at Einstein's. I'm telling you right now, I know this. Okay? That was going to be my food for the day. And so I'm going, okay, so I'm just going to go to Einstein's, and I'm just going to sit down, and I'm just going to just not have coffee, and I'm just going to wait for my son. Next day, I get off the bus, drop my son off. I run into another guy. He says, hey, um, you got $2? I said, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> But it was too specific. And lo and behold, there's $2 in my pocket. So I gave, I gave him $2. I said, I said, okay, I need to find somewhere else to go after this. Like, I can't be doing this life. Little did I know that God was teaching me happiness. The next day would go, and somebody asked me a random number. Can I get $6? I'm like, bro, how do you know I got $6? <laughs> how do you know I got $6? I don't know. I just need $6 to get something to eat. I said, why not five? I looked, there's six dollars in my pocket. So I gave him six dollars. Every day went by. I remember one day Greg can testify to it because Greg, Greg, Greg didn't have no car either. We two just broke Negroes. Um, <laughs> just, just trying to just make it out here, you feel me? I don't know what we were doing. We got no plans. None of us got a job. We just out here. Right, Greg? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and, and so one day I'm walking down Commercial Boulevard and a lady in a red Toyota, like an old school red Toyota, stops in the middle of the street, stops in the middle of the road on commercial near Dixie. 
that blah, that's all blah. And she goes, she goes, there's something about your spirit. I'll never forget it. Grandma will remember it. She said, there's something about your spirit. There's something about your heart. Do you have $5 for my daughter and I? And I remember by this time, I was like a week into it. So I, I said, yeah, 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 I got $5. Here you go. I gave it to her, walked away. Greg goes, what, the, what, what was that? What just happened? Jackson is a test, can testify to this. There was a day I was at Char Hut, maybe two days later, in that same month. I'm, no, we weren't at Char Hut. We were outside Char Hut. It was at Char Hut. We were at Char Hut, and some random lady walks up to me and says, hey, um, I need a burger for my kids. You got $7? Jackson's like, who asked for 7 I said, yeah, I got $7. Here you go. That's all I had. Jack's like, what just, what was that? I said, it's, I don't know. I just, it keeps happening. <laughs> that whatever's in my pocket, that's what somebody's coming to me and asking me for. In a season in my life when I was the most broke, had the least of things, no job, no title, no recognition, nothing, ain't no... BCT was my limousine. That was a time when people were asking me for stuff. And I remember as those days continued to progress, something in my heart started to change. And I remember the last day. I get, I'm at the corner, I'm at, I'm at Panera Bread over on Federal. Never forget it. If you want to go back and just lay hands on that place. So that's when God did something in Isaac's heart. I was in the corner. If you know where that corner is in Panera, nobody goes in that corner. Nobody walks over there. That's where I like to hide and do my meditation and my reading. Some guy in a suit walks up to me. He says, hey, listen, man, I'm having a tough day. Do you have $7? And I said, yeah. Yeah, I got it. And I gave it to him, and something supernatural happened to me there. When I gave him the $7, I just heard a resounding voice in my spirit say, have you ever needed anything these last 30 days? Have you ever been hungry these last 30 days? Do you still have clothes on your back these last 30 days? The birds in the air, have they wanted anything? Does a squirrel fear if he's going to survive tomorrow? If I do it for the birds in the air, what do you think I do for you, brother? And I remember just breaking down. I was, weep I was weeping. I'm going to thank God I was in the corner where nobody was at. Because, man, I look like a wreck, just a big dude with a beard, just crying for no reason. And I started to weep because all of a sudden the joy of the Lord just took over my spirit. And then, you know, the hood came out of me a little bit. So I call my wife right after. And I say, I say, Va. And she probably hear me like go, <laughs> Va. And she's like, what's up? I said, we gonna be good. We, we gonna be good. We gonna ball out, girl. And we're gonna be good. And she's like, oh, okay. Oh, okay, Isaac. You okay? I said, I'm good. I'm so good. And we gonna be good. And God's gonna bless us. And she's like, oh, okay. And I know why he's going to bless us. Because he's giving us so that we can give. He's blessing me so that I can give. And I learned that day what it means to be blessed. When I share that story, people are like, I feel so bad. I said, no, 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 no. No, don't feel bad for me. I feel bad for y'all. I, I did that to somebody. I see people come out at Bentley's. I'm like, oh, poor guy. What? Oh, he's so sad. He's doing it for some quick looks, but then he's going to go home depressed. And look at me. I get to sit down and just enjoy life. The goodness of life. I'm married. I got two beautiful boys. They ain't too crazy. I got a family that loves me, people that love me. I'm here, y'all. And if you ask me, I am the richest man on the planet. You want to know why? I don't know, but looking back, I'm trying to count. We haven't been able to do tax returns for five years. You go, I'm putting everything out. I'm sorry. I'm just going to put myself out. By the way, if you ask for financial advice, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask for. 
Okay, we just went through assessment, and they were asking us about financial training and all that other good stuff. And I'm like, so how are you with managing your finances? I said, I need finances to manage. <laughs> so I can't really tell you how I manage. I need, I need money first, then manage it. You know, like, I can't, like, how do you budget? Uh, I need, so if, if I have $300 coming in that month, I'll explain to you how this works for me. If $300 comes in that month and my bills are like $2,000, my budgeting is prayer. <laughs> That's how I budget. And he was like, okay, all right. Are you sure? Well, let, let's see your tax returns and let's review them. I said, I haven't earned income in five years. And they go, come again? I said, I haven't earned income in five years. How are you alive? I said, I am the richest man on the planet. I get to live, be with the right people, do what I'm called to do. And as Paul said, I know what it's like to have a lot. I know what it's like to have a little bit. And I've learned to be content. Ready for this? I know God's going to bless me. I know that. But you know what I know? I know I don't need it to be blessed. Yeah. Now, if God gives me anything after this, it's icing on the cake. You want to know why? Because there's something that I've learned is that God gave the greatest gift. And that gift was enough. Yeah. 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 The reality is that God gave us Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus was enough. And for everybody in the room who says, I'm still struggling with this giving thing, I've been there. I know exactly what that looked like. And God's still working on it in me, even as I'm growing in him. But what I've learned is, is I shouldn't feel guilty for learning to be generous. You want to know why? Because even Jesus had to learn generosity. In Philippians chapter 2, it says he learned obedience. And yeah. in, in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that he learned to be obedient. Obedient to what? His life. He learned to obey by giving his life. He had to learn. He was at the Garden of Gethsemane. And even then, when he knew what he had to give, he said, God, can you, can you find like something else instead? Like, can it not be my money? Can it not be this? Can it not be my, my life? And yet he had to learn obedience when he went up on that cross. He had to learn to obey. He had to learn to give. And when he sacrificed his life on that cross, don't think it came just out of just this immediate desire. He struggled to get there. And when he got there and he learned how to give, he gave his life, lost it. But he said, he who loses his life, will gain it. And not only did he gain his life, he gained glory. For he went into a grave, sacrificing it all. And he rose to glory. You know, there's some things you won't experience until you learn to obey. There's some things you won't encounter until you learn to sacrifice. You say, Pastor, I'm closing. I know I'm over time. I know I'm over time. Sorry. You say, Pastor, I, I get what you're saying right now, but this tithing thing, man, that's tough. I say, don't, don't do it. Because if you're not giving it cheerfully, don't give it. Yep. Yep. You're not learning anything by so grow in grace. Listen, God, I can, I can give you 50 right now. I think I can learn. Learn to give 50. Just learn it. Okay. Wow, I'm, I'm seeing how God, God doesn't bless you with a car. He blesses you with perspective. And so when he begins to change your perspective, you're going to notice other things begin to change. Next thing you know, your wife starts looking better. Your husband starts looking better. Your kids don't look as crazy as they used to. You start loving life more. You start enjoying life more. Next thing you know, when you give to somebody, you're not going, what is he going to do with it? Like, I don't get this homeless man because I'm afraid of what he's going to do with it. You thought your donation was for him? How selfish. God's blessing you in the giving. Woo. So you want to learn to be happy? Do what? Let's try it again. You want to learn to be happy? 
I can't do it. That's all right. You can do it with Jesus. For if you have died with him, you can rise with him. If you can die to your old way, rise to a new way. Experience the newness of life. Somebody shout out, be generous. Be generous. Bow your heads, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Lord, we thank you for teaching us, God. Continually teaching us your heart. Lord, learning, God, what it means to give. Learning, God, what it means to be blessed in giving, God. Learning, Lord, that we give because you gave. That we give because you loved us. That we give, God, because you cared for us, God. We thank you. Lord, for all that you're teaching us in you. And God, we're believing, Lord, that you will restore our hearts. We're believing, Lord, that you'll restore our minds. We're believing, Lord, that you'll restore us in you, that we'd be shaped in your image, and that we can experience your resurrection. And we say that in your name we pray. Amen.